I'm really thrilled by this audience because it is not only filled with the wonderful members of the Costume Designers Guild, first and foremost, but we also have fashion students from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. So thank you students for coming out. And as a bonus, and thank you for allowing me to invite them, we have members of what I call my film family, fans of classic film who they've been to most, if not all, of the TCM Classic Film Festivals and most, if not all, of my events on classic film costume design and its connection to fashion today. So thank you all for coming. But most of all, thank you, Mark, for coming today. This is so exciting that you're here today. Thank you. You know, I want to thank all of you for coming, too. This is so exciting that we can all be back together. And I'm really proud to think that you uh, started off our, our, our this with the artists. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to be here talking to you. Uh, we, you know, so... Uh, Away we go. <laughs> Mark is also a huge classic film fan, so you're going to have to pardon us while we dig deep into, <laughs> into that. But I'm going to start with you, young Mark, early life. I love hearing the origins of costume designers, and I know you got an MFA in costume design from New York University. But where did the passion begin? You know, uh, Niagara Falls, uh, the, the the winters are long and, um, you know, <laughs> the, the, you know, the imagination reels, you know, you watch classic films, you uh, can't wait for Halloween to happen. You have uh, a mom who uh, loves going to thrift stores. Um, there was a so from an early age, there was a love of old things mm -hmm. and and then of course channel 29 had the the 12 o'clock movie and uh I, I for some reason i was just drawn to the the glamour of the movies and uh kind of the the escapism of films and then of course putting it together with you know loving old things or antiques or old clothes or whatever my halloween costumes were just the greatest homemade things you could get you know and um from I, you or your mother who was making the costume um I, you know i was directing her <laughs> <laughs> um so uh you know and that that was that was really it so at some point it all started to come together you know i what movie book did i want for my birthday or christmas i still have them all with my 12 year old signature in there so make sure everyone knew they were my books um uh, i found some book reports that i would do charlie chaplin or and how did you different. weave those into school the, you know, they were happy to take whatever you gave them in Niagara Falls. You know, <laughs> somebody did the assignment. Oh, boy. Um, but I saved those. And and then, you know, uh, uh, in high school, I got into theater and was in a play. And I guess people do a sketch of their costume. So I and I because I always was drawing and things uh, during those long winters. And uh it just seemed like the right thing to do. So I fell in love with performing in theater, the camaraderie of people. When you're in a play, you you work these long hours and, and you become very close to people. It, good, clean, fun. My mother knew where I was. Um, and then did more plays and then got into Na uh, Niagara Falls Community Theater. And, and they had a incredible storeroom of clothing that was donated and costumes. Everything from like a Worth gown from turn of the century to like 40s multicolor things, just people, things donated. And that's when I got to touch them and be excited about them and use them in a play. And it just it just kind of snowballed. And you started when you were still in school, were you working in the theater over on the East Coast? 
Cleveland? Yeah, oh, yeah. Not Niagara Falls Little Theater. Uh, I did. But when the you Royal were at Family. NYU, did you do any Broadway when you were? Uh, no, off no. Broadway. Off Broadway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that counts. <laughs> it does. It did. Um, you know, we. You have to fall on your face before you can fly. I think you know. I, I look back at some of those uh, examples of design, and I'm, I cringe a little bit. But you know, you do what you can do, and you do what you think is good. And and yes, not everything's perfect. And and, and was the ambition always to come out to Hollywood? Were you ever entertaining, staying in the theater, or was it always no? It film? was always film. It was the program at NYU is very uh, geared towards live theater, dance, opera, ballet, whatever. Um, and I was always like, mm, I, I'm going to get the the ideas, the concepts of design, rendering, contrast equals interest, whatever they're teaching, but I'm taking it on the road. I'm taking it to, to work in film. And of course, they have a good film uh, department at NYU, Tisch. And... Um, so I did work with a few student films, um, but I, w I was working also at while I went to graduate school, so that it was tricky. And so when you came out to Hollywood, how quickly were you paired up with Richard Horner? Well, the reason I came out here was he asked me to come out and assist him on a film called The Grifters. A little film called The Grifters, yes. You know, I'd worked for Richard as a design assistant on Miller's Crossing in New York. And I kind of was hired to measure clothes for a couple of weeks and then ended up being their New York assistant while they were in New Orleans. And then his next film was Grif The Grifters out here. And I'd never worked out here, but apparently he liked my work. And I had been working at a Broadway show and that had just closed after like an incredible run, like a 10-year run or something. And I was completely at liberty thinking like, what am I going to do? And uh, the fall of 89, there seemed to be a lot of people heading west from New York. So I was like, yeah, I'll be there. When do you want me there? And I, they had a department car. The, the wardrobe department had a car. So all I, after work each night, I would go and drive around and figure out how to get around. In Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know who Richard Hornung is, so he worked a lot with the Coen brothers. This is for the classic film folks. So we've got Miller's Crossing, as Mark just mentioned, Hudsucker Proxy, Barton Fink, and so on. Um, what did you get out of that collaboration with Richard? I know that you mentioned you still have things that he said Ab come to you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, you know, there's there are just a way to work kind of politically as well as, uh, you know, things that you should stay away from. At, like, don't get into... <laughs> The, the fray with stunts or anything. You know what I mean? If a stunt goes wrong because you didn't dress them right or something, you know, it's going to fall on us kind of thing. You know, there are lessons like that. You know, he was a very textile oriented person. He'd been a dyer. Um, he also had a master's degree from uh, Champaign-Urbana in Illinois, I think. And um, so we were very similar in like, loving fabrics and loving history and and loving menswear and uh so i learned a great deal about about fittings and you know the i really came in the line of fire because trey wilson had had an actor who'd been supposed to be the lead in miller's crossing the the cohen's had written it for him and he suddenly died like two weeks before they started shooting uh, Miller's Cross. And so you had been working on the costumes. Right? Well, yeah. And Richard was already in New Orleans and they got Albert Finney. So I had to do Albert's fitting in New York before he at at, at um, I forget the name of the, the tailors, but Vincent's at Vincent's in New York. And so like trial by fire right there, you know. And so I guess that's where Richard got the idea that I could probably handle working on the grifters but there was a good learning curve and uh, I had another there was another assistant costume designer Kimberly Adams 
And, um, you know, and then, of course, I, it's hard to say what Richard, I feel like he's with us every day, the way we run a department, the way we think of design, the way we, I, I'm always out in costume houses looking for original garments in which to base my designs off of. And Richard was very hands-on that way too. So, um, you know, it's a curiosity and a love for the clothes and what do they speak to you and how do they, how can you make them into a character? Right. And so then you became a costume designer, moved from being an assistant costume designer with Paul Thomas Anderson. And I find it interesting, I talk in my events a lot about in the old days of Hollywood, costume designers were affiliated with studios for many, many years. Um, you know, you had Milo Anderson who was at Warner Brothers for nearly 20 and Vera West at Universal for nearly 20. But in the 70s and 80s, everything shifted. And so costume designers most often were affiliated with directors rather than the studios. And Richard Hornung is an example of this. And you are as well with Paul Thomas Anderson, who he has a long and ongoing relationship with. Um, your first two movies with him were Hard Eight and a little movie called Boogie Nights. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> can we just get a round of applause yeah. for Boogie Nights? Yeah. So what was, so now you're essentially on your own. I know you have a team with you, but now you're leading things, you're managing things. Yeah. What was your collaborative process with Paul Thomas Anderson? Yeah, uh, well, you know, when I wor started working with Paul, he was a first time, first time director. Right. And I was looking to get a, a director's under my belt, you know, directors that would have to call me. You know, we hit it off because, again, he's somebody who, who has great knowledge of, of films. He loves it. And uh, so we hit it off on that level. And it, he, he knows about clothes more now. But then he was all about the writing and he knew the music and he knew how to edit and things. But the, but the clothes in those days, I don't know, what is this, 27 years ago? Um, you know, he was leaving it up to me. And we talked. He had an idea. He There were certain collars that he liked or a film. You know, we watched The Detective or something. As yeah. at, in a, Frank you, Sinatra. You watch films with Paul in, like, the most fringy way. And, and you get a whiff of DNA off of it but never get caught stealing anything. Right. I mean, he's he's gone on TCM saying that he has TCM on 24-7. They have a TV at right. his house that just right. has TCM on. Right, because he feels like it permeates him creatively. Um, and I, I'm sure you're pretty much the same way. Yep. Um, so that segues me nicely into a conversation I want to have and I've been asked to have with you on period costumes. Because um, if I had a dollar for every time someone reached out to me to talk to me about period costumes and how generally inaccurate they tend to be, at least in classic Hollywood. Um, so if you think of something like 1934's Cleopatra uh, with Travis Banton's costumes for Claudette Colbert or 1963's Cleopatra costumes by Irene Sharaf, they're more, they're less historically accurate and more either the designer style voice and or the style of the era in which they premiered. You, my friend, are not that. Uh, you are a master of period costumes. And let me just tick off a little of his filmography for you. Really? This is your life, Mark Bridges. <laughs> Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> so we have the artist. We have your experience with the Coen Brothers movies. So the ones that I just mentioned, those are all period. Paul Thomas Anderson. We mentioned Boogie Nights. You won your second Oscar for Phantom Thread. We saw your acceptance speech. Yes, please pause for applause. There will be blood. Most recently, Licorice Pizza. 
Then we go into Ted Demi's Blow, uh, Stephen Schoenberg's Fur, David O. Russell's The Fighter, which you might not think of as period, but it is. And then now out in theaters, we've got Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, which I know you're gonna win for. <laughs> so the thing about you that makes you a master is that I do know that you've done research and you also adhere to what costume designers are meant to do, which is to create the character and to support the story, and to bring the director and or producer's vision to life. But you also, and I'll use a marketing term, you surprise and delight the audience with your costumes. They are a genuine pleasure to look at, but yet they do not take the audience out of the movie. You are still very much in it. They are not jarring. So in a nutshell, how the hell do you accomplish that? It's funny that you, we watch the artists because as I was sitting there, uh, you know, what I do when I watch old movies is like, what makes this 1927? What makes this be 1948? You know, uh, I, I try to like see. Like as far as what, shoulders and yeah, colors. We did a, a film called The Master with Paul that was 1950. We did Inherent Vice, which was 1970. You know, and you try to get to the juice of like, what makes this that year? What What is it? about this so and then you you try to try to zero in on the things that couldn't be 72 they couldn't be 67 it's really only 1970 or it's really and you go either way i usually go a little earlier um and that's where the original clothes come in like looking going to I love to go to the costume houses, whether it's Western or motion picture or American, wherever. I, I love going there and just the, it's an archive there for me to walk in and touch and see fabrics and see shapes. And this I don't get a good vibe off of this. You know, it's it's not that it's just this isn't that Sally. You know, this isn't the character Sally, but this could be Sally, you know, and and then that's a springboard for me actually touching clothes i have whether it's fabric clothes whatever um that's that's how i do it i looked at this film tonight and you know we had a very low budget for it we yeah, and i actually what was the budget um it was a 10 million dollar film uh and I, we probably had like two hundred fifty thousand dollars for those costumes and there were a lot of costumes well there weren't that many because um when when you're doing black and white you can reuse that yellow dress again and again. It's just on a different person. So you don't say like, there goes that yellow dress again. <laughs> and so you just endless combinations of hats. But I look at it tonight and you know, I think Michelle changed the title cards. Like I might have had, if I think he stretched out the story a little bit after we shot it. Because I, if I had, there's a few things that I would do differently today, minor, but, you know, I strive for perfection. I'm like, oh, that boutonniere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we love you for it. <laughs> um, but uh, I would probably have made a little more of a nod in the women's clothes to the early 30s. But you look at the old movies, you look at like Mary, they're having Miriam Davies on right now. And, uh, you know, <sighs> and, uh, you look at the early 30s and it still feels very 20s uh, yeah. because not everybody, it was the depression, it's not everybody's up to speed. Um, Hollywood dropped the hemlines, but even not then, you look at Barbara Stanwyck and Night Nurse or something, her nurse <laughs> uniform is like right to her knees and that's like, I don't know, 31, 32 or something. And uh, so I thought, okay, in Hollywood, they were still going to show a little leg. They were still going to have a well, defined... Well, we're talking about pre -code. They're showing more than Defined leg. waist, <laughs> you know, more so than the style. But then also we had the budget constraints, too. 
Um, so I just kept endlessly using <laughs> the same 20s clothes and, and, and felt are you, it was okay. Are you, you know, like you mentioned looking at vintage clothing and getting inspiration for it. Are you then creating every single piece? Are you ever buying vintage and putting it into a period production? Or, or I do a lot of renting, a lot of hiring. Like the dress in the beginning uh, that Missy Pyle wears at the premiere, that was a dress that I think Michelle at Motion Picture had in a box, and it had problems under the arms, and it, but it it felt like it was intact and it was good. And so, because I knew I was going to be in black and white, we did some some repairs under the arm, and I added those lame tails and a piece of motif here, and I made a corsage, and it worked out really well. You know, Zappos, T-strap shoes, you know, um, and you, a lot, there was a lot of Los Angeles street shopping in the artist, whether it's, yes, um, Le Los Angeles street leather coats, um, Santee Alley, rhinestone jewelry, that kind of thing. You know, the audience in the beginning, that was a lot of it was tiling. We all, we all know it the tiling is where they keep moving the groups and then they photograph them and then put it all together. Um, so I, and then I had ABC group and the C group was wearing like Ryan, you know, sequin dresses from, from jet rag and, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it, you, you learn after, years of doing this what will fool the eye what if what the camera will see um so that you know that's that's that something like phantom thread i felt i didn't have all the money in the world but they did know it was a fashion movie so they gave me a, a decent budget you know and staffed me very well in london and um i really wasn't able to get many clothes from the States, but I knew I needed some things from here. Right. And we made a lot of the clothes there. Uh, there, a lot of the clothes were made there or there were existing clothes. You know, Paul loves the patina of used clothes. That's why we make where we need to, but we try to use real when possible because that's my what my director liked. So the artist, Let's pull back to the artist for just a minute. Um, it's obviously special in many ways, and one of them is for your Oscar. Do you know what is special about your Oscar? Jennifer Lopez gave it to me. <laughs> That's pretty special. Okay, another thing that was special. So for most of you, I'm sure you know that costume designers did not get an Academy Award until 1948. You had to wait 20 years to get that award because the Academy Award started in 1929. Um, and originally, the Oscar for costume design was divided into color and black and white up until 1967. And the last person to win for black and white was Irene Sharaf for His Afraid of Virginia Woolf in 1967. You are the first costume designer to win for a black and white movie since that point. Wow. Happy, happy, proud to follow in Irene Sheriff's footsteps. Absolutely. Well deserved as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. No, that's interesting. I didn't know that little fact. Um, and then another thing that's special, and you can tell me true or false, but I think from the clip that we saw, it's true that it was filmed in color and then converted to black and white. That that was the trick because it was so low budget. They wanted to make sure that they could sell it in any market. And there are like Southeast Asian markets or something that only want color. So there are actually versions of the artists out in the universe not, that are color? Not sure about that. Couldn't wow. say that with any authority. But when we were making it, I think they wanted to have the broadest possible net um, to, to be able to sell it. And right, because so, you were saying you didn't even know if you had a distributor yeah, originally. No. At the end of the shooting, the grips were like going to Michelle, uh, how are we going to see this? <laughs> Um, is it is it going to be out or is it going to be in a DVD store or what? 
um, we didn't, we needed a distributor. We, it was just all a labor of love. We just did the best we could. We shot here in Hollywood. Another thing that struck me, and I, I might have mentioned this to you, is watching this film again, I thought how much the Hollywood community meant to me being able to do what I did and also props and set. Like we, this is, as far as I'm concerned, the center of the universe for filmmaking. And I've got all these resources. I've got costume shops. I've got archives, miles of clothes on rails to to use and to create and uh, all those prop houses and everyone all of my vendors were so generous with me and and you know it really is a hollywood movie on a, a bunch of levels and that's one of them it is because it was shot at desilu right i mean it's called something else yeah it's now, like but red or something yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. uh-huh we, yeah we shot there and and at the bradbury yeah the bradbury um you know, the the usual suspects of but sets. But it's expensive <laughs> to shoot here. So it's amazing that, you know, you guys were able to do that for yeah. such a limited budget. Yeah, we had a producer named Richard Middleton who was very clever with, with <laughs> and you were allocating clever. those resources. Well, yeah, when I first got the job, I would go to thrift stores to try to get background shirts for my background men, like just – had to be certain collar width. Hopefully it was all natural fabrics. But that's where I started to, to try to get a stock. Right. And then, I mean, did you have Edith Head's glasses to be able to determine what colors look like in black and white? I think you mentioned on there that you you took pictures. Yeah. Or Do you remember when we used to have digital cameras? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you could switch it on to black oh, and that's white. That's right. That's right. And uh, but I just did a black and white movie this summer, and so we you can t desaturate it all the time. But there's like four different black and whites on, right, right, on right. your iPhone, right, so like we were we're not even <laughs> sure. We were like, okay. I wonder if uh, he's Maddie shooting in noir or if Maddie's <laughs> shooting it, you know, but we got the ballpark. But it, the digital, when we did camera tests, we took a picture in color and then we took the picture of the same color board from the art department in black and white. And it's so interesting. It either has to be high contrast because there's a whole bunch of medium tones that to in color, it's all that's pink, that's lime, that's whatever. Black and white, all the same. So it's so learning curve and uh, luckily I found out rather quickly that textures like lame or beading or satin or something uh, read better. Uh, you know, you, you couldn't go wrong with the color if you had a, a zippy texture. A little sparkle. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, let's talk inspiration because this is an area that I know my classic film fans are just freaking out about the artist because Michelle, the director, talked about how 1928 show people was sort of the impetus for him. Um, and then he rattled off um, F.W. Murnau's Sunrise, Sunrise 1927. Yeah. Um, Billy Wilder, we get a little Sunset Boulevard in a couple places. Mm -hmm. Orson Welles, we get Citizen Kane in mm -hmm. a couple places, including that great breakfast scene where the couple statues move further and further apart. Um, and then I see, and I was surprised I never read um, 37 William Wellman's A Star is Born. That seemed like an obvious reference point. And then Singing in the Rain, too, um, I see some scenes. So were there any of those that were your reference points, particularly for Peppy? Who were your reference points for her or inspiration? Well, I, first of all, I would say, like, you caught us. Um, <laughs> it's not a catching, <laughs> it's appreciating. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Oh, but, but even things like I would look at Singing in the Rain to see what you saw in the audience and – you know, so that tells me I'm only seeing waist up and, you know, what's catching my eye is, uh, you know, the 
glittery jewels or whatever, you know. So this this informs me on how what I how much I need to dress the audience. Um, you know, sure, there's a little Lena Lamont in in Missy Pyle. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all it's all that flavor, and you you use it. I used a lot of uh, show people for the people on the other side of the camera because that movie's so great of sh being shot on MGM at that time. And you saw what the workers wore or secretaries or whatever. You're just, you're just always looking at things to see like, how can I apply that? Or what, what looks good to me in 1928? How can I translate that to now? Did our dancing daughters 1928 come into it? Mm, not, not really, I mean, you know, not really. I, I maybe the fringe skirt, yeah, maybe that's what I was that saying. Joan like takes off. Yes, the under thing, so she just dances around in the fringe skirt. So maybe that, but not consciously. Certainly. Right, right, right. I had amazing hair and makeup people on this. Too. I was going to ask you how, what that relationship. My friend is. Sydney Cornell, who was like the person that Richard used all the time. They were really good friends and I'd known her since Grifters and she did the hair and then Julie Hewitt did the makeup. I saw new things tonight with that makeup tonight. His pencil little mustache and then she changes. So good. Just a, we had such accomplished people on this film working for we got paid, but it was the love of it. It was the love of it. Absolutely. We wanted to do it. So one of the, I mean, there's so many things I love about you, and you know this. Um, your attention to men on screen. Sometimes the focus gets put so much on the women. And for Jean, for the character of George, um, I know Douglas Fairbanks. I mean, we see mm -hmm. clips of the Mask of Zorro in mm -hmm. it where, you know, the close-ups are Jean, but the rest of it is Douglas Fairbanks. Yeah. And then John Gilbert, because both of them did not successfully make the transition to mm -hmm. talking pictures. Um, and then Jean looks a lot like Gene Kelly <laughs> in some of those shots and a little Frederick March as well. So who were your points of inspiration for him? You know, I think in his heyday, George is, uh, was John Gilbert in Show People when he's driving on to the lot and then Mary and her father try to get in on that. It's, it's sort of an immaculate look, Hamburg. Uh, menswear. I, I I do love menswear, classic menswear. So and then that sort of the white flannels and the navy blazer. These things strike me when I watch the film It. You know, they go on the yacht. Uh, that that kind of sportswear for men. It's still necktie, but it's sporty. That's your casual look. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the ties are casual. Yes. <laughs> you know. So um, yeah. Uh, all of the above, probably not Gene Kelly, and probably not so much Singing in the Rain. There is that sweater vest that Jean wears that's kind of ombre, those diamonds. That was a find. We found it, and it's in shades of gray. And it's so because it's ombre, it's flattering, and it's interesting in black and white. So, you know, I, there, I looked at these things, and there were a lot of things that were godsend garments, and I consider that one of them. And, you know, the dress Missy Pyle wears that I was talking to, just things that I had something else for Missy Pyle at the beginning. And I was like, this just isn't going to work. And then Michelle pulls this out and it's in a box. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and she's quite tall. So I she's was worried tall. that the length of it wouldn't work. But it just skims the knee the way that uh, an actress would have worn her skirts. So. And back to the men. I mean, I couldn't help. But comment to you during the film, the ties. I just love the ties in classic film. And you have done so beautifully in the artist. Where did you source those? You know, probably all these uh, wonderful archive rental houses that we have here. You know, men's wear is so uh, can be kind of shirt and tie, yeah. shirt and jacket. Uh, so what you really have to tell a character or juice it up a little bit is is the neckties and wanted to make them as deco as possible. And there's a certain weight to them that are thicker. 
you can get away with things, but I do feel like the camera sees everything. It's kind of why I love film as opposed to theater. I, I would love to challenge myself with some theater, but uh, that's why down to the necktie or a, a pocket square or something, I feel like it's going to be seen. So you really have to pay attention to it. Well, and especially when it's on the big screen. I mean, a lot of the movies I write about, I try, I really try to make sure I see them on the big screen because the details of the textures as you're talking about, um, and even though they're in black and white, the ones that I go to see most often, um, you can tell the different colors that are in the ties, for example. There's just, it's just so much, and it's great to watch with an audience as well. So let's talk about Phantom Thread, which now we're shifting away from classic film as the inspiration and we're in the world of fashion. And one of the things that I so appreciate about this movie for you is that not only are you responsible for creating the character of Reynolds Woodcock with Daniel Day-Lewis, what he wears, how he puts himself together, but we, the audience, don't believe him as a couturier without your entire massive collection of his work. That's a tremendous achievement. Um, I know that um, Paul Thomas Anderson mentioned that he got inspired by learning about Balenciaga and that Reynolds Woodcock was largely based on Charles James. Where were you going for inspiration for this character and his work? Yeah, well, you know, Paul and I would sit around uh, and uh, look at books or look at movies. There's uh, one of the things I did for TCM was Paris Frills, which is very similar to Phantom Thread. There are elements of that. It's a film that was shot in Paris in the couture world in 1945, still during the occupation if you get a chance to see it it's really interesting um but i didn't see it before we made phantom thread i guess paul forgot to tell me um, <laughs> does he know luckily, about that movie? tcm told me about oh, it boy. but uh yeah but um okay there's a couple of levels the the we had to create the real world we had it's always the job of doing the characters you know, Daniel knew this world because, I, you know, I guess his dad or his grandfather or something, poet laureate of England yeah. or something, you know. So he knew this world of, of these sort of artistic aristocrats kind of thing. And, and there were a lot of things that he contributed to it. He's got an immense personal style. Um, he wanted to get things made at Anderson Shepard. It's several row. Um so I was like, sure, okay. Uh, do you guys have the money for that? Okay. Um, and uh, shoes m made at, you know, in the store of the Royal Arcade and things. So it, he knew of this world. He, And so he was, we collaborated a lot, but I was going to be like, you know, okay, you know these people, this is what your grandfather wore or something, you're right. fine. And then I have to work it out like, okay, if I get, I can afford two suits, a pair of pants, a sport coat, and a tuxedo. And I socks. Should, I should be able to, yeah, I would get texts about like, why don't we get some pink socks from Italy? So, sure, <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> Okay, um, because you know Paul wanted to keep Daniel happy too, you know, it, whatever. And and Daniel had a million ideas. I mean, one day I was like, "Where's Daniel?" And he's like, "Oh, he's out buying pen nibs with the set decorator or something." You know, I was like, "Okay." Um, <laughs> Now, is that a unique thing? Are actors and actresses generally so involved in their characters, or is this... It's unique. It's unique. <laughs> I think to that level, I think it's unique. So um, but so that's how consummately involved he was in that. Oh, he t but what I loved about it, I was taken into this whole world of Savile Row, handmade shoes um drakes which men's wear they have one in new york now but it was only in it was in london and, and bud's shirts and just all these fine men's wear places that i never would have been exposed to i had two shoppers 
to source fabrics for me. I had an amazing uh, cutter, Cecile Van Dyke, who her mother was in couture. And and she had her own business of, you know, gowns and wedding dresses and things, too. She was really fun to work with. And she brought an incredible crew with her. I also had a cutter for background and then a step. So it was England. So it's a little <clears throat> easier to crew up with that many people in England. Uh, Were the people on screen actually in the industry? They seemed uh, in very Phantom Threat. In Phantom yeah, Threat. Thre Thre yes, the the two older ladies who are the main fitters. They both. One of them started as a young girl, like eighteen, at Hardy Amos, and um, yeah, they had worked for various couture houses there. We met them uh, when we went on a on a research trip to London with Daniel and and got to see archives from the V&A, the clothes that they had. And those women were working there and Paul took a fancy to them and he's like, hey, would you like to be in my movie? And, and they did a great job. They did they amazing did a great job. job. But when everybody's sewing on the wedding dress that got ruined, that's most of my cutters and sewers and everything came down. Yeah. So the workshop is the real women who were in the workshop. And so where did you start with your design process? for? Because there's several key gowns in it. Where did you start? I started... Uh, Big Paul and I sort of sat and thought like what gowns could possibly be the beat dresses, like the countess's dress, the wedding dress, whatever. You know, uh, at some point, Daniel came on and wanted to be involved with uh, with the, you know, uh, designing as part of his prep. That's unique. As part of his prep, <clears throat> you know, and he came in and and he and he said to Paul, he's like, well, it's already done. And so Paul takes me out to dinner and he's like, we're going to have to have a meeting with Daniel. <laughs> and so we did. We had a great meeting with Daniel. Daniel wrote a couple of little sketches of a couple of things, dresses. And of course, then it becomes our thing of how to, how to make these loose sketches into actually working garments. And the two things that uh, were kind of inspired by Daniel preparing for Reynolds Woodcock was the first gown that we see that's sort of purple and pink. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one was a, um, a suit, skirt and kind of military with a half cape and the long feather hat those those two things were really really sketched out and we figured out what that could be as a garment it's a it's a matter of respect it's it's a process that I don't usually work with so I, I needed to feel my way through that happy to do it because I like Paul want to make an environment that is creative for all parties. So, and as far as designing the collection, there were things that I thought were cool. There were uh, things that I thought were that moment in time, 55, that I thought was in England, uh, you know, through lines, you know, it's, there's a, we have the, where we dis debut the purple dress. And it's all these women coming down a large staircase. And Paul, we were looking at YouTube things from England with Princess Margaret and their mother or whatever. And he goes, basically, these are all the same dresses. So we had some made in, uh, made up in Italy or we had other dresses. So one sherbet colored dress after another comes down the stairs. And then Reynolds Woodcock dress comes down, which is very different from all the status quo of the moment. Right. Um, so now I want to just come to the closing and by talking about the current pictures you've got, the Fablemans, and then you're in production or post-production with Bernstein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so both period films, again, but now they're both based on real people. So what is the process with 
directors when you are talking about, I mean, it's Spielberg's family. So are you looking at pictures? Is he saying duplicate this look? Does he give you creative license? How does that go? You know, kind of all of the above. I think when I had an interview with him, uh, he, he said these chilling words. My mother had great personal style. <laughs> what does that mean? I worried about that. Okay. And then, you know, as you get home movies or photographs and things, you start to see the through line of his mother, Aaliyah, and uh, his dad, Bert. Uh, his dad's character's name is Bert. Um, uh, and you and you take these bits, you do your research, you reinterpret it, you use things that you think will work for a moment in a, a scene or a through line. Uh, funny things. I did a lot of little dropping pearls in there for Steven. You know, he collects antique uh, Hawaiian shirts. And so I have a little, I found a little boy's Hawaiian shirt that was like a PK. And I put it on little Sam's character in one of the scenes when his dad says they're moving to Arizona. Just to drop that little pearl in there. I'm not saying like, Steven, look how cute. <laughs> no, it's just like, go out on set, kid. Um, <laughs> um, and then some... Uh, some black he wore there's a little picture of him when he's three and he has some two-tone shoes on so when they i found little two-tone shoes and put them on steve you know there were things like his mother made this poncho it's a plaid poncho she made it out of blanket she put a hole in it leather trim around here she wore it around as a poncho this is the personal style part <laughs> um and um so we did that we oh I had one made. We got an antique blanket and got it aged down with leather, and then but I didn't tell him when she was going to wear it. I just had her wear it on to set when we were doing the camping scene, and he she walks on set. He looks at her and he goes, and so I knew I'd gotten him. <laughs> you know what I mean? He never said a word to me. He paused, he tilted his head like a memory, and he went on and shot the scene. I That's never so heard a word about it. That's so interesting that he didn't pause to say. No, no, no. There were a couple of times where, you know, I'm always there to establish things. So, you know, put things out there, wait for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> and um, I hear a couple of times it was like, where's Mark Bridges? Hi, over here. And he'd be, my mother used to dress just like that. And I'd be like, cool, cool. Um, and it was so sweet, you know, I feel like I, you know, because I, it was such an honor to, first of all, be asked by Steven to work with him and then to be uh, like entrusted with illustrating the idea of his family and recreating. So, so when, you know, I, we, I laugh, but it actually meant a lot to me to get a reaction out of him because, um, you know, the first time that he saw his mother, father and the uncle Benny together in this one scene, I, I actually think he teared up kind of thing. So I, I had done my job and, and we were on the right track and it was, it was actually quite beautiful throughout. Um, you know, just trying, trying to do justice to his story again, if your director's vision and tell a story, you know, the Bernstein biography goes from 1943 to 1989. Wow. Um, and it's part black and white and part color. Wow. And so, um, this came in handy <laughs> for some experiences and, um, we have, you know, Again, it's telling story. It's it's seeing what they kind of wore, and and making people sexy at the right time, using clothes to communicate what's going on in the scene, or or uh, absolutely recreating moments like the debut for Mass that he did in Washington in 1971. 
we just recreated that from fragment pictures. You could tell what it was and then we did our own thing. Or you just, you just choose things that are the right period and tell a story. Right. Okay. So in closing, and this is for selfish reasons, because you are a classic film fan, what, and I know people ask me in those all, what are your favorite classic films? And it's like choosing children. But are there any that you turn to either to relax or there are ones that, and this is for the costume designers out there, are there ones that really get your creative juices flowing? Um, any of that, I would love to hear. So what price Hollywood okay. for <laughs> what price Hollywood? Because it's such that moment in time. And I think it's 1932, I think. Yes. Okay. And they show the Brown Derby. They and, show it all. you know, back. Yes. Uh, it's very much like this where you see behind the camera, you know, it isn't all it's glossed up to be some young actress wants to be. So I love what's. What price Hollywood? I love all the versions of Star is Born. Sure. But, you know. Um, well, it's uh, almost like your experience in coming to Hollywood and being in awe of the city yeah, and all that. Put my feet in the yeah. Gromish Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I relaxed too. And I said this because I did a thing with Alicia uh, about now Voyager. Yeah. That's the one I relaxed to. Okay. Yeah, but it's also, you know, it's it fascinates me every time. In what know? way? Just, you know, it's 1942. It so, so, you know, there's the mother in the high collar long dress. The mean who, mom. Yeah, and then there's the she, you know, I love a good makeover. makeover. Yes. Everybody loves makeover. And so that kind of that kind of stuff and, and her striking dress that she wears the first night home and, you know, but I'm also a pushover for the romance. So, um, you know, that makes me relax. Um, Mildred Pierce, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, I just like look at those shoulders on that fur Milo coat. Anderson. On that fur coat. In this book, there is Mildred Pierce. You can't even believe it. I mean, football players don't have as big a shoulders. <laughs> no, and the the irony of that is that Michael Curtiz, who directed it, got mad at her and said, absolutely no shoulder pads in this movie. I guess Milo Anderson didn't get the memo because she has never worn bigger shoulder pads than in Mildred Pierce. It's like a fur coat with shoulder pads yes. over a suit with shoulder pads. So it's yeah. unbelievable. Triple decker shoulder pads. It's um, how hot must she have been on set? It's unbelievable. But so things like that, I, but I, I do love it all. I tend to go for the black and white, actually. It's, yeah. it's interesting. It's relaxing. Uh, except things like Barefoot Contessa. Oh, beautiful. The, those it, Italian sisters okay. did the gowns. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm always fascinated with Irene Sheriff, like how she does a, a, the palette in West Side Story. Oh, gorgeous. Like to tell the Montagues and the Capulets. From I think Western Costume did a great social media post where they showed her, um, they showed the, you know, the dance with them side by side. And then the fabrics and the colors that Irene pulled for her. It's fantastic. Yeah. So that, that kind of stuff. I, I am always kind of fascinated by the costumes. Yeah. Can't get I away. wonder why. Can't get away from it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for all of this. It's just been oh, a joy talking my pleasure, to you. Really. And thank you again my all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Do we have time for like a couple questions? Do we? Oh, boy. Ruth has got her hand up. Go, Ruth. She's asking if there, if he goes to vintage clothing stores in other locations, oh, if sure. you're on location. Oh, absolutely. Um, no, because no, because well, you you know things 
I have a long memory and I remember what the vintage stores were like in 1990 yes. as opposed to what they are well, now. Well, Doris like, Raymond's the way we wore. Love I mean, Doris. There we go. Love her. Lo every show I go to Doris. You know, um, but I don't need to go here. But I thought, you know, you were asking me when I go on location, do I? For sure, because we don't have the costume shops and everything. I need to, even in New York, um, early Halloween was closing and they were, or they're getting rid of their stock. And so every time we needed something, we would go and try to see if they had it there. It's it's just getting harder and harder, especially in it. Uh, to find things. I haven't found uh, a good catch of stuff since the fighter when we were in like Lowell, Massachusetts, you know, but you're constantly looking and you need to go and look and, and find places. I, th I think in London, we found a really, I had all of a sudden I had a new scene. We were bringing actors from New York and everything. And I, I remembered that my assistants from Phantom Thread took me to this place called Relic in London, and they had what I needed. They had what I needed. So you just always have to be sensitive to what's available. Uh, you can't be caught uh, without. Uh, or, <laughs> yeah, that's a way to put it. Anybody else? Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then we see it in the Never Cursed sequence. Yeah, can you talk just about that dress? So we're talking about Phantom Thread, and the question was out about the mother's dress. Yeah, the wedding dress that Reynolds supposedly made. Um, I actually based it on a Lucille dress. I thought that was the era, Lady Duff Gordon, yes. who had been on the Titanic yes. and stuff. Um, Lucille Sister was Eleanor Glenn. Yeah, oh, that's right. And 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 uh, Lucille would have been around the time that Reynolds would have been young. It would have been a style then. And, uh, you know, we ran into clearance issues. You know, the lawyers were really like, and I guess the law was as if the designer had been dead for 70 years. Then you can copy it. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I was like, okay, when did Lady Duff Gordon <laughs> die? <laughs> and, and so, and I had a photograph of some uh, like Detroit heiress who had Lucille do her wedding dress. And it had kind of this, it seemed like a Russian headdress kind of thing. And so it was great fun. Like I had also been to Italy to Tirelli when we were looking for clothes. And so I saw how Tirelli does all the layer on layer on layer of trim and this and that. So I wanted to do that for that wedding gown. And so it was a copy of Lady Duff Gordon from a photograph. And uh, luckily she'd been dead for a while. <laughs> <laughs> But I love a reference to Lucille, so that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, he's walking around with the mic now. Thank uh, you. So I was just going to ask because you were talking about going to these uh, history, like where you're finding the clothes that you're studying, and I was going to ask if there was any piece that you've never gotten to talk about that has really stuck out to you that you haven't gotten to use specifically in a piece, because sometimes. When I'm searching for costume things, I go, God, this is such a cool piece. Nothing I am working on fits this, but I'm going to keep it in my head and I will talk about it next time somebody will listen. And I wanted to give you the floor for that. It doesn't stay in my head anymore. You're just really? moving on. You're like, um, you, but when you really need something, it's good to acknowledge that because when you really need it, you're just like, what are we going to do? What are we going to wait a minute? I think I remember seeing a twin set at Western. At least it was there 12 years ago. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. That's when, yeah, it was a cool thing. Yeah, you do, I, that's part of my hunt and search thing that I love is you find the coolest things. You know, during There Will Be Blood, you'd find original work clothes with removable buttons, like 1890 jackets, probably at American or something, right, Polly? And uh, 
and, and you just be like, I want to do a line. I want to do the 1911 line, yeah. you know, because it's so cool. And it just so happened that the rest of the world was doing the 1911 line at the same time. Work close. But yeah, you, you file it away for another day and it will come in handy. I can't think of any right now, but uh, you, you draw on it when you need it. Um, so my question for you is for someone who is currently a fashion student and, you know, dreams of being getting their foot in with TV and film. Um, what is one recommendation that you would give? Because sometimes, you know, I feel like I want to do it and I want to do it now, you know, but I'm still in school. I'm still learning, taking in the knowledge. Um, what is one suggestion like to get your foot like in the water? Yeah. the You know, I we. People ask me that a lot, and I can only speak from how I did it, and that was a kind of a different world yeah. um, of, but basically it's it's like do as much as you can, see as much as you can, make yourself available for people, uh, certainly not to be exploited, but but certainly to learn as much as you can. Like I said, I work, I took a job that was with Richard Hornung for sizing 20s clothes and it was supposed to be two weeks okay but you show up you're motivated you do a good job the cream always rises to the top people recognize that and people want you or they will recommend you to other people um that's how it happens and and one foot in front of the other with sort of the eye on the prize like where you want to get in this journey and uh, and I think and then all those decisions kind of fall into line with getting to the end. And I, I don't know how, that it's going to happen fast. I mean, I came to Hollywood in 1989. Uh, um, you know, we're here today. That's it's been a while. Um, but it was like assisting and then it was doing my own cheap movies. And then it was accidentally running into a first time director who I've now done nine films for, you know, and some good ones. And, <laughs> you know, you, you know, and, and it's one foot in front of the other. And, and it's, you know, I always wanted to be a film costume designer and all my decisions were based on that end goal. And if I can add, even though I am not a costume designer, but it's sort of like, don't let the money deter you from taking a job. Like, see it as an opportunity to just keep growing. You know, like, the more experience that you have on your resume, your CV, the better. Um, and, I mean, it's it's actually a small town. So you will start to network easier and easier the more that you're working, no matter what it is. I agree with you. I actually have known people over the years who didn't take jobs that could have been good opportunities because, and I'm not even sure if it was out of necessity, like I can't eat on the salary. It's just like, no, I want to get paid more. It can't be about the money because you got that that ultimate goal there and you'd have to see it as an opportunity. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Kiriana. I'm currently a student at Otis College of Art and Design here in LA. Um, I'm just curious. I know we've talked a lot about um, sourcing materials, fabrics, textiles, all of that. Um, do you personally find it more rewarding to source things and happen upon um, a luck of an item or more towards uh, constructing personal one-of-kind pieces? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, it depends on what it is. It really, it depends on the needs in the film. Sometimes I have a whole bunch of period clothes, but I need one of them to, you know, go through several stages kind of thing. So then I'm going to make, and then I'm going to try to find fabric, you know, that, that, and, and I love that, you know, because because my goal would be to make it seem seamless. Like I have a distress or breakdown artist in, in New York, Catalina, who, you know, does great, great work. And she helps make all the used Western wear and then the new clothes that I get made for Tom Hanks or like News of the World. Um, they was all new and they have to match the patina of the thing. So I love making it. I've had fabric woven and things like that for 
projects. It doesn't happen that often, but um, I, I love it all. I love it all. And it, it's, it's dictated to by what the project requires and the script requires. Um, so I wanted to ask, what would be your most memorable costume disaster that has happened on set? <laughs> Just something fun. You know, it didn't happen to me per se, although I had to feel it, field it. It was when I was assisting Richard and we were doing Barton Fink and we had just picked up the uh, bellboy, bellhop uniforms from uh, Romano's tailors. Remember Romano? And of course, this is goes to like break it down. It can't look like it just came out of the shop. So fearless us, um, load up a washer. And we're gonna, we just wet them. We just wanted to wet them, mush them around, spin them. It's wool. You're not gonna agitate. You're not gonna do anything shocking. Okay. All you're gonna do is wet it, mush it, and spin it. Okay. And then hang it up. Well, little did we know that Romano had flatlined the trousers with like cotton canvas. So, so the canvas shrunk oh, up God. and the outside skin was just buckling along with that. And we were like, oh, <laughs> oh no, these we're going to location at the Queen Mary tomorrow. We need these. Okay. So it was immediately like take them apart, separate the flat lining from the thing. But so that that's my most memorable uh, tra possible tragedy, but we fielded it. It was okay. And we probably the next day we were like wet in a suit. <laughs> like it didn't scare us off. It was just like, oh, that Romano flat line that. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Johnny Hagen. I'm a first year costumes designer at um, LACC. And I'm also from Buffalo, New York. So when you talked about the long winters, I was like, girl, I know what you're talking about. But um, my question is from maybe either like recent projects or stuff more in your earlier work, what do you think was a project that you had the most fun on? And maybe why was it like such a memorable experience? Yeah. Oh, you know, a couple come to mind, and it was a long time ago. Oh, no. Um, one, one was Boogie Nights. I had a really great time with Boogie Nights. I had a lot of freedom to to contribute as I wanted to. And, like, Dirk's age in the film was the age I was at that time. So I really remembered, you know, what I thought was cool but was really tacky. And um, and so, and I remember 77 to 84 really well. And that was the most fun. I had a lot of freedom. I was in LA, 70s clothes were plentiful. It was just fun. And I had like five palettes and it was really rocking good time. That was good. And then also the film Blow, but that, was because our director, the late Ted Demi, was such a fun, great guy and um, made everything, you know, if I got a little like oh, worried about something, he'd be like, you got the job, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, okay, great, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and I also had a lot of freedom creatively with that too, as long as I worked it out with, you know, the actors. What would you say, like, percentage-wise, how many shoots do you feel complete creative control versus the ones that you really feel sort of dictated to? I don't, you know, I don't know. I always feel like I'm contributing. Uh, you know, there are just varying degrees of, of director involvement and actor involvement mm -hmm. and things. So... But I always, I always feel like I'm bringing something to the table. We know uh, you that. Know. No, I so I get us. I get I get what satisfaction I can get out. I tell people, you know, and you all know it too, that we're the last ones to be happy. Like after the director, the actor, the DP, the accountant. Yes. Oh, maybe either maybe the production designer. And Maybe then the producer's wife is then weighing we in. <laughs> get to be happy about what's going on camera. So, um, you know, uh, 
I, I feel pretty happy yeah, like, most of the time, yeah. Like I I brought it to the table. Even if you've got a rack of clothes for fitting, I brought it all. I brought it to the table. So you don't like that? Well, how about this? I brought it. It could be anything. I, it could be what I said it might be. Just work from this rack and I'll be fine. Well, I definitely feel like attitude the attitude that you bring to it is really important that, you know, you almost have the, I'm not flying an airplane here. Um, people aren't going to die by these costumes. Um, but like just keeping that even keel, despite what opinions are flying at yeah, you. Yeah. But you, you protect yourself with that too, by having an opinion, by having a point of view, you got it down cold, you know what it should be. Cause you've talked to the director and stick with that. I think you, you um, uh, flounder when you you're not you don't have a strong opinion about what it should be. You should be flexible, but you should definitely have a concept and what we're doing, what this film is like, what the rest of the film looks like. Like you're the expert. You've been hired for. I've been that. hired to make sure that, say, Stevens movie has a cohesive look. Stephen was funny though. We had a scene that got cut out of the of Fablemans, but it was like a dead grandfather coming back to talk to Sammy. And I get a guy, the actor, dressed up, and we go show Stephen, and he goes, "That's one, not what a ghost looks like." <laughs> <laughs> oh, what does a ghost look like? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, so it was like that. It's that kind of thing, and you have to stay flexible when the go when you find out what a ghost looks like. Okay, um, what was it like being on stage at the Oscars, and did you get to keep the jet ski? You know, I, I that was he had the shortest speech, so he won for the, the jet one ski. you saw was the shortest speech that night, and it was gag that Jimmy Kimmel did, and and they start to come get you from the audience. Mark, come here, and I'd be like, oh no, <laughs> I won the jet ski, <laughs> and then they take you backstage because they're still giving out awards. You go to the green room, and you're still and then they come get you there and they're like mark come backstage oh no <laughs> and um you know there's helen mirren and a huge jet ski and a couple of life jackets <laughs> i was like okay i guess this is it and i put i for, i don't know why but i just put the life jacket over my Brioni tux. I guess the costume, you get a life jacket, you put the life jacket on. So you get up there and I I said to Helen, I was like, all I can think of is singing in the rain, dignity, always dignity. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, oh, I, I sometimes like to poke holes in dignity. And I was like, oh, okay, that means it's gonna be okay. Yeah, so all of a sudden then I start like practicing. Okay, I'm gonna put this in my left hand and I'm gonna go like that. Okay, I'm ready. And so you just take a deep breath and you go and do it and- um, So wait, you did you have to, did I miss this? Did you have to go out on stage yeah, they rolled, on they the jet ski? They rolled out the jet at ski the Oscars. with Helen Mirren on the back no. in a gown like this. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and this, is, this is the Oscar. And oh like the, my yeah. God. Yeah. And I look down and I see Paul Thomas Anderson cracking up. So I was like, okay, this is okay. If, <laughs> if, if Paul thinks it's funny, then okay. Wow. But, you know, I did get to keep it, but I didn't want to keep it because the minute I come off stage, they're like, here, could you sign this W-9? Right. It's like the a taxes. game show. Yeah. Like I had, and it was an $18,000 jet ski, oh, and I was going to have to pay taxes on it. Taxes on no, no, just the jet ski. <laughs> just the jet ski. So I was like, to my agent, Wayne, I was like, we got to scrape this off. We got to figure <laughs> out how to get rid of this jet ski. So um, WME figured out, okay, if you don't take possession of it, if you and I gave it to drum roll 
Motion Picture Television oh, Fund. Oh my God. I gave because it was the motion picture and television event. I also happen to love what they do. I think it's really important. I gave the jet ski to Motion Picture Television Fund. And, you know, it's an organization by us, for us. And they auctioned it off. And, wow. and they, they got the money for the jet ski. I sure didn't want it. They asked me, have you had any experience with jet skis? I was like, none good. <laughs> none good. So um, that uh, it, leading up to what you're talking about, the, the jet ski went to the motion picture television. Book. And for those who are watching this interview online, please donate to the motion picture television fund. <laughs> by us for us thank you again everybody this has been so much fun thank you thank you guys too